Dan Millman is probably best known as the author of The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. He is the author of about 18 books total. He is working on a memoir and has taught Peaceful Warrior workshops all over the world. As a coach of Stanford University's gymnastics team, Dan developed his unique way of coaching, which I suppose we could call the way of life coaching. You'll see what I mean in this episode of Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. All right, so I am here with Dan Millman. Dan, welcome to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you, Mr. (laughs) O'Brien. Well, it is certainly a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Millman. After all these years, I've been a big fan of your work, um, especially the... uh, uh, Way of the Peace Warrior, honestly, was a book that, that changed my life in the, back in the 1980s when I read it. So I've always been eternally grateful to you for that. But I also know you've written something like, what, 20-some-odd books? Well, I'm working on my 18th now. Okay. Yes, and Way of the Peace Warrior changed everybody's life back in the 1980s. Well, what do you mean by everybody? Well, I'm just being frivolous at the moment because <laughs> I don't know if it's allowed, but we should mention that you and I sometimes walk through Brooklyn's Prospect Park or bike around it together. We've been friends for quite a while. Quite a while. Yes. And, 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 and that's a relationship as interviewer and interviewee. Yes. Quite so. Quite so. Yeah. Um, so what's that called? Full, dis- full disclosure. Yes. We are actually friends. And I will tell you that, you know, one of the reasons that came to pass is because I was really, I, I really was. It was a very, very important book to me back in the late 80s. And um, somewhere around that time, 89, 90, I started a, a company in New York City where I promoted seminars, Tony Robbins among them. And you were one of my few, my next uh, few guests that I, I brought to New York City to do a seminar there. And I was, it was so amazing to, to meet you in person and to get the wisdom um, that you brought to these seminars in such a down to earth, fun way. And I, I, I'll never forget when it was done after this like really profound weekend. It's like, Hey, so, uh, it's Sunday night. What do you want to do? So, and you were like, let's go see Star Wars or something that was in the movies at the time that I, I was a little, um, shocked that you wanted to do something so like fun and frivolous. It was just great. I should have worn robes and so an open robe. <laughs> yeah. The robe would have been a good touch. Yeah. <laughs> so could you tell me a little bit about where that came from? You were, you wrote that book when you were a student at um, Berkeley? No, actually I, I met the old man I described who reminded me of the ancient Greek Socrates. So I named him that uh, in, in the story of way of the peaceful warrior, but 14 years passed before I actually wrote the book. So I was um, actually, wow, I'd been a coach at Stanford University in gymnastics by that time and um, also a, a college professor at Oberlin College. So I had quite a few, and I'd met two of the four main primary mentors in my life um, who inspired me in a sense. They didn't provide a lot of content, but they expanded my horizons and, and enabled me um, to write some of these elements of the way of the peaceful warrior. It was part of my evolution. Mm. So I was not a college student. I described my life as a college student when I met the old man in the service station, for those who don't know the book. Um, he was an old um, mechanic, an all-night mechanic, that I, I stumbled into the service station about 3 in the morning after a late night date and met this cosmic old guy and he inspired the, the character in the book. Cool. Did you were a college student at 
Berkeley at the time? UC Berkeley, right. UC Berkeley. And you were a gymnast. You were a, a gold medalist in uh, the World yeah. Games in trampoline? Uh, I did win the first world championship on the trampoline in London. Um, and I, I was an all-American type gymnast, uh, national champion a couple of events. So, yes, I did a lot of gymnastics and trampoline. That was my background as a, as a young man. It's funny, I'm, I'm currently working on my 18th, maybe final book, uh, and it's a memoir. So it's the true story behind the story, and it won't be out till 2021, probably, or 2021. Um, but I'm involved with that now, explaining all that background. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's fresh. Yeah. So you were, you were a coach in gymnastics as well. You went from being a world class athlete yourself to coaching at Stanford? Yeah, and there's a wandering path there, but I did end up coaching after I graduated from Cal. Uh, I actually sold life insurance for a while in Los Angeles. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I, I was a psychology major when psychology was mostly experimental, rat studies, and so on, and that didn't interest me. They hadn't invented humanistic or transpersonal psychology at that time. So, and that's what I was interested in, but it was just about rat studies. So I didn't go on in psychology. Um, and, it, and I was married, baby on the way, um, that way back pretty young and I had to find a job. So they were training people and paying them to sell life insurance that lasted about two months, uh, over the summer. It's a wonderful uh, career for many people, but it didn't, wasn't a fit for me. And then I just, by coincidence, visited my old coach back in Northern California and he said, Hey Dan, just yesterday, the coach at Stanford left to be athletic director up in Alaska. Um, why don't you go talk to the AD? So I did. And at 22 years of age, I was the head gymnastics coach at Stanford University. That's outstanding. Wow. Was for the next four years. Yeah. So again, that uh, it, I was, a, a, even before I was a, an official coach, I used to teach at clinics and camps and work with kids. So I developed and honed communication skills and uh, a certain empathy for what made sense to them and how to express and analyze how to do things. So I couldn't pretend to teach. I had to really find a way that would help them learn. And uh, there was some motivation involved, of course, and meaning. And so I, and I was studying the very Zen aspects of Zen at the time. So I had kind of an East West approach to provide more meaning um, for the activities as a path or a way. And I often explain to people, you know, the word do in Japanese, judo, kendo, aikido, uh, cha do, which is serving tea. Um, all these words end with do, which means the way, the way of uh, aiki, the way of tea. And they imply that it's a path to personal development, not just a thing in itself, not just about winning or losing. So when I coach the gymnasts, um, they, they were treating it as a study break. And by the time I was done with them, they considered gymnastics a profound form of study, not a break from study. And maybe the most meaningful they would do in their college career in many ways, because it works with the body and the mind, the emotions, the spirit, if you will. So I was a bit of a, a different kind of coach. Hmm. One, in fact, I, was, I had a reputation after a while. The coach from USC came up to a, a dual meet with Stanford once. And he said, Dan, I hear a rumor that you have your athletes meditate before a competition. And I said, no, of course not. I'd never do that. I have them meditate during the competition. <laughs> <laughs> because, it, it, you know, obviously anybody who's done sports or thrown frisbee or played a musical instrument like you have mm. knows that it is a form of meditation. Uh, it's an absorption. Uh, getting in that zone, that flow state, and time flies. So, that's how I started out coaching in athletics. And then my interest expanded out of the gymnasium into everyday life. So rather than looking for how we can create more talent for sports, I started asking bigger questions. Is there a way to create more talent for living? Mm. Uh, what skill sets do we need that aren't taught in school that can help people in their everyday lives, their relationships, their work? every aspect of life. And that was a kind of a spiritual search that sent me for 
a decade or two, two even, um, in martial arts, gymnastics, um, and a lot of reading and then studying with various mentors to uh, look at life's bigger picture. So I guess in a way, I was one of the first quote unquote life coaches, Hmm. Uh, even though I haven't actually put out a shingle in that regard. I, I view myself as a teacher personally rather than a coach. I don't hold people accountable. We don't check in every week or month. There are people who do that in a wonderful way, but I, I just kind of give what I can in a seminar or one-on-one session with people uh, and then kick them out the door into everyday life. All right. So that's, that's wow, that's a great story. So it's fascinating to me that do means the way of all those different things. And it, gives, it reminds me a little bit of a quote from um, – Marian Williamson, I heard her say once, she said that every job is a front for a church. And, uh, nice way. Of putting it. Yeah. The, the way she meant that, I, I believe, is that, that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're, a, you know, a salesman of life insurance or whether you're a, a newsman or whether you're a therapist or whether you're a coach, that it's all, in a way, you're teaching the way of being a good person. You know, the, how to how to be a human in the best way possible, and that's what you're always doing by your actions and by your way of being with other people, your connections with people, the, the judgments or you know, um, compassion that you bring to a situation. That you're you're demonstrating through who you are, you know, the right way of living. That, that whole role modeling. Uh, Albert Schweitzer once said, "In influencing other people, example is not the main thing; it's the only thing." Hmm. And uh, another mentor of mine once said, if if people are only mouthing the words, if they're not living what they're teaching, then they they can mouth the words, they can say them a lot, pretty words, but they don't have the spiritual authority to really have an impact on people. But if they're at least practicing sincerely to do what they teach, then their words have more impact. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what what do you say would be the essence of coaching? If somebody is looking to be a coach, a life coach, now that that uh, you might have been one of the first, but there are lots now. So if somebody wants to join into that profession, what would you say is the essence of coaching? Good question. I um, Part of it's semantics. You know, be, someone can call themselves a coach mm-hmm. because people recognize the term from sports. Sure. And today they probably recognize it in the context of life as well. Um, you know, a sports coach, you presume they have a certain expertise in the sport they're coaching. Mm -hmm. But a life coach, there's a certain hubris attached to it because, oh, I, you know, a 22 year old, you know, I'm going to be teaching you life, how to live well. Um, so there, there is some hubris attached to it. But if somebody is practicing, if they have gotten a sense of the bigger picture, um, to me, a coach is someone who, supports and assists someone to be their best self, but with a particular goal in mind, a field, whether it's business uh, or in relationships, their relationship coaches, their financial coaches. So I think it's helping people toward their goals. You know, I used to feel a very big difference of training and gymnastics just to train, which can be a cool thing, going bowling or practicing this or practicing that. But when you're training for a competition hmm. or for a performance, that gives it an entirely different focus and yeah. much stronger sense of purpose. So if you're coaching somebody, you don't just kind of talk about life and what are you doing. It's what I think a goal is very important, a purpose, an aim, a goal, and you help them uh, work toward that. And that means giving feedback. That's one thing a coach can do um, is to provide um uh, set of discerning eyes and to check in with the person regularly um, and see how they're doing. So it would seem to me that that is all about coaching toward a particular purpose um, rather than just teaching where you teach the subject and they absorb it to their best ability and say, thank you. That was interesting. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I started running. We talked about Prospect Park earlier. Maybe it was before we got on the air here. But, uh, you know, both of us live in the part of Brooklyn called Prospect, uh, uh, sorry, Park Slope, but near Prospect Park. 
And I used to start running there back in the 80s when I first moved there just for health. And uh, it was good. It was fun. I liked it. But it wasn't until somewhere around 82 or so when I met members of the Prospect Park Track Club. And they were all like running in order to run the New York City Marathon. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted to compete in the marathon. So I thought, well, I'll try that. And and it changed my running considerably. Yeah. You know, it was it wasn't just for fun, just it wasn't for health anymore. Now that there was now there's a purpose behind it, and something to measure against. And I could measure against my my progress in shorter races to see how much better I was getting, if at all, if I was moving in the right direction or not. Um, it was it, it changed things a lot when there is that you know, like you said, performance or competition or that thing involved. It's it. I remember once when I was working with Tony Robbins, he said the word competition comes from the um, Latin conspitore or something like that. That is, you know, to conspire together. The idea is that we're conspiring together. So that if we play basketball against each other, you know, we're going to both of us try to win. We will work as hard as we can because by conspiring together like that, competing together, we hold each other to a higher standard and we, we grow that way. You know, it's funny. I, I have my own particular tension about the whole idea of competition versus collaboration. Um, and I don't want to get too serious, but I believe our existence as human beings on this planet is going to be dependent on making a fundamental shift from competitive mind to collaborative mind. While we're competing, nations competing against one another, parts of the world, different people, ethnic groups, and all that. When we see an other that we're competing against, the common belief is competition stimulates excellence. Well, there's a book I read a long time ago called No Contest, How We Lose in Our Quest to Win. And it was by uh, some smart PhD from Harvard, Alfie Cullen, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. And it made some very good arguments and really uh, – uh, good, good arguments in favor of collaboration, that whole collaborative mind. And for example, if I play tennis, I don't see an opponent across from me. I see my teacher mm -hmm. and, my, and my student. Mm -hmm. Because whether they intend it or not, um, I'm going to improve better playing with, with them than I would hitting the ball against a uh, backstop. Sure. Uh, so they will bring out, they will show me my weaknesses. They'll bring out my best. They'll make demands on me. And so I don't have an adversarial relationship with them. I see them as my teacher and student. Right. I'm their teacher because I'm going to do the same for them. But it's a different mental state. I'm not saying we should do away with competitive sports, but I think we should do away with competitive mind and recognize we, we are all in this together. It is a kind of conspiracy, as you say, rather than the whole competitive thing, because com competition is based on comparison. Mm -hmm. And the Buddhists say that comparison is a form of suffering. Because as soon as we compare ourselves to someone else to see if we're better or worse, we're disrespecting our own process of learning. People learn differently. Some people learn quicker. But sometimes those who learn slower learn it better than those who learn it quicker. Mm -hmm. So we need to respect our own process and respect who we are and how we work rather than thinking we're better or worse than somebody else. That's, yeah. So yeah, I, I get that. That's yeah. great. You know, and it's, I, I think it's a kind of a situation where it, it is both because you're still going to be playing competitive tennis. Sure. You're, you're still going to be, you know, that guy across the net might be your teacher or your student, but I still want to play as well as I possibly can. And, and, you know, stretch and get that shot, you know, would make it in. Yes. Yeah, I did it. And I really feel that way. And then at the end, we hug and say, Hey, great match. Man, that was fun. Um, you know, there's, there, there's a difference. Like you said, that you don't get rid of the competition in a way that the sport is still there, but it's a different mindset behind it. Well, for example, I ask people sometimes, if you were playing tennis or any other game, would you rather have a mediocre time where you really don't play very well, but the <laughs> other person plays even worse and you win? Or would you rather have a game where you don't win the game, but you play the best you've ever played? Which would you prefer if you had a choice? Yeah. So I, I don't tell people, I don't suggest to people uh, aim for success because we can't control that. Mm -hmm. I say aim for excellence because we can control that. Love it, yeah. You know, and as a having, going back to the Prosper Park Track Club where I did start running marathons, 
I loved running marathons. I never won one. <laughs> I never, I never came close to winning one. That was evident from the time the gun went off at the beginning of the race. There was no way I was going to win one of these things. But I was, you know, throughout the, throughout the race, I was like gauging my progress against the, that guy in front of me that I've been with for the past two miles and see if maybe I can catch up to him. See if maybe I can catch up to him. And, and then somebody else starts passing me. He's like, Oh no, you don't. You're not going to pass me. And so like there's all these little, little games within this whole race. Yeah. And of course, at, and it's really ultimately you're competing with yourself. You know, how well uh, did it do with the other? Again, I, I've always found that an interesting term too. Uh, competing against yourself. Like what is your arm competing against I your said leg? with myself, not against, with myself. Oh, oh with yourself, competing <laughs> with yourself. To do what? To best your time, right? Yeah. Yeah. To do better than I did last time. Sometimes I have people who've approached me and said, Dan, I'm doing pretty well in life, but you know, I'm young and I'm dynamic and I want to unleash my full power and, and I, I want to do a hundred percent. And I go, you know, I want to reach my full potential. And I go, uh, maybe you did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What are you going to do now? If you reach your full potential, you know, you, is it free play? Gee, that might be interesting too, just to have a good time and. You know, there was somebody, I think John Duyard, he wrote a book, uh, and he suggested people always go 80%, aim for 80% of your max the best, because uh, that way you get fewer injuries, less stress. You still improve. You don't improve quite as fast, maybe, because you're not being as intense, but you're having a better time in the process. And that always made a lot of sense to me, rather than the whole go 100%. Was that the attitude you had when you were a world class gymnast? When you no, were well, first of all, I was so nearsighted when I was a kid that I could never see the scores. You know, the judges raise their scores after mm -hmm. your competition to see what the numbers were. Because gymnastics is a weird sport; they shoehorn it into being a sport, but really, it's a performance art. You aim for a beautiful performance, a routine that you either hit or you don't. Uh, try aiming for perfection as best you can, and then the judges, of course turn your unique performance into a bunch of numbers. And then they compare the numbers to see who was best on that particular occasion. So I never took the numbers very seriously. I just, did I hit my routine or didn't I? Mm -hmm. So it was more of an internal measure uh, rather than uh, how did I do in relation to these other people? You know, did I do well? If I did, that was, that was great. Um, but that's what I cared about more than not, even back then. Even back when I was a naive, young, self-absorbed athlete, whereas today I'm a self-absorbed uh, you know, teacher. <laughs> yeah. So when you won the gold medal, how did that feel? Uh, oh, well, for many reasons, as I'll relate in the memoir. Um, that was an extraordinary uh, occasion. But I, it's a longer story I, I couldn't do justice to here. But sure, it felt, it felt uh, you know, it's like they can't take that away from you. You know, once you're a world champion, you're a former world champion forever. Hmm. And that's kind of a neat thing to have on your life resume. Um, but uh, many things had to come together. You know, there are no self-made people. I don't believe in the idea of self-made men, self-made women. I, I had the help of so many people mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of luck involved in timing. Sure. There were two people on another day could have beat me. I just happened to come through on that particular occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got but, it. Stars have to align. So, getting back to life coaching for a minute, if somebody's listening to this program and wants to discern from Dan Millman what he believes is the uh, a truly essential coaching skill, I mean, what what would that be? What's something that somebody can't do coaching without? Well, why don't you and I brainstorm that? Because I think it's in a very very significant question. You know, when I was uh, a coach. And an athlete, I, I was looking for these qualities that create a more talented athlete. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, okay, um, is talent just innate? You're just born with it or not? Or could it be developed? And my own non-empirical research, uh, observing for years other athletes and myself, it seemed to me that, that talent, what we call talent, which I would define as the ability to learn something faster and easier and rise to higher levels, higher potential. To me, that's physical talent. And it seemed to me four qualities made up that, uh, what we call talent. 
strength. Clearly, anybody who's strong, it helps them in most sports. Muscular control. Um, stamina, so they can train better. Suppleness or flexibility can be very helpful in many uh, endeavors. And finally, sensitivity, which is the most important. Now, under sensitivity, I would say that's things like coordination, rhythm, timing, balance, reflex speed. So when I was a, a coach at Stanford, um, I instead of when, when new freshmen came in, uh, rather than just diving into learning new gymnastic skills, we worked on that foundation of talent. We made sure that they were strong, that they were flexible. We worked on all those things. I even had exercises to help improve their coordination, their rhythm, their timing, their balance. And my my experiment, my theory didn't work out in practice. Uh, the team was at the bottom of our conference when I first started coaching there, the very bottom. There were high school teams that could have beat them in the area. Um, by the time I left, four years later, it was one of the top three teams in the United States. Hmm. My theories did work out in practice uh, by working on their level of talent. Now, the reason I bring that up, Doug, is because um, I, I analyze what qualities make up a talented athlete. What qualities make up a talented teacher or coach? Maybe we can brainstorm that. Certainly communication ability would be one, right? Couldn't ignore that. A coach can know lots, but if they can't communicate it well, so the, the person they're talking with gets it, um, if they can't show ways for them to feel it in their body, depending on what they're trying to learn, then it doesn't do much good, no matter how much they know. So expression, communication ability, the ability to empathize, because um, you're not just teaching a subject or coaching a subject, you're co coaching a person with their individual quirks. So I think the ability to kind of get a sense of where they are, where they're starting from, what's important to them, mm -hmm. what are their values and interests and talents, um, that makes a big difference. So th those two things, empathy, I think humor really helps because things can get so serious. And it's good to keep, by humor, I mean more of a cosmic perspective, not get so wrapped up in the whole success thing. Mm -hmm. They have to be successful. That means you're doing a good job and you're successful. Um, so I think humor or perspective, which is the better part of wisdom. What do you, what do you think? Anything else come up as I'm talking? Those things certainly are, are accurate. And I would also say that, you know, it just reminds me of a coach when I was running with the Prosper Park Track Club back in the 80s. Um, there was a coach there named Harry Murphy who had started the Prosper Park Track Club. And he's also the guy who measured the first um, – Five borough New York City Marathon. They used to be runs just six loops or five loops or whatever of Central Park. He was the first guy to measure it to start in Staten Island, go through all the five boroughs. And wow. uh, he did that. Yeah. He did that on a map using a compass because that's what he did in the war. He was a, he was a navigator or whatever in the war. Anyway, Harry was a coach for the Prosper Track Club. Wonderful, wonderful man. But when I observed him coaching different people, the thing that always, always amazed me about him is he always was able to find just the right thing to say to each individual person on that team. And it was always different. You know, everybody was different, but he was always able to find that the right thing to say. Sometimes he was really encouraging. It's like, yeah, you did it. It was really encouraging. Other times it was like, yeah, it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was always what that person needed to hear, you know, in order to, to, you know, light the fire in their loins kind of thing. That, was, that, that, that can be developed, I suppose, but it's also a gift. Well, it's certainly a gift. I, I never developed it to that extent. That guy yeah. is brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. I, I certainly endeavor to um, to do that. I, I try, like you said, with communication skills and, and empathy, et cetera, I, I try to figure out, you know, how is this person organizing their thoughts, their life, and et cetera? What, what do they need to hear? What do they need to um, – be shown or whatever in order to help them get to the next level, whatever that might mean. And it depends what you're coaching them in. In the yeah, sport, it's different. Sure. Uh, it, it's different. But sure. in, if, it's, if it's just in life or in a relationship, then it involves some other skill sets and yes. experience and knowledge. You know, there was a coach that I met. He was His name was Dick Wolf. Uh -huh. And he uh, he told me about the day he went to the athletic director at a, at a Cal State Fullerton, I think it was, in Southern California. 
And he, and he's, the athletic director said, so you, you want to be coach of the gymnastics team, huh? And he said, yeah, that's what I'd like to do. The athletic director said, well, what Olympics were you in? And he said, oh, I wasn't in the Olympics. He said, well, well, what national championship did you win? I didn't win any national championship. Well, where did you compete in gymnastics? He said, I never competed in gymnastics. <laughs> but I love the sport. I've analyzed it really well, and I've studied it. And he said, if you want to hire an athlete, well, go hire an athlete. But if you want to hire a good coach, that's me. And he was coach of the year like three or four times. Wow. The whole nation. So – I think you have to you kind of love it and be involved with it and care about it. Um, to me, motivation is based on meaning. If something doesn't meaningful to you, why would you be motivated to do it? So I think finding the meaning in each, what do they call it, complex equivalent in NLP? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it helps, that- what is somebody's meaning? For some, yeah. it's recognition. For other people, uh, it, it's fame or uh, proving themselves. It's finding out why they do it. And sometimes it's as straightforward as asking them. If I were a coach, I'd have a questionnaire and ask them formally or informally to go through these to find out more about what's important to them mm-hmm. and then uh, go from there. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah, it is it's it is really true. And people do have meanings for different things and it, it, different, different meanings for the same thing. So the same cause effect can take place and people can interpret it in very, very different ways. That's really brilliant. So, um, I don't know if you can answer this next question or not, but I want to ask it to you anyway. Um, if a person is a coach working in the field, um, how, what's an essential skill that they might need in order to actually be successful in business as a coach? You know, I had a blank when you asked me that question, and I believe the blank was because it may depend on the type of business. If they're in sales. Well, I mean, as a coach, if they want to, if they're in the business of being a life coach. Oh, they're in the business of being a life coach, not coaching somebody in the business field. Right, 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 right. Okay, I got it. Um, well, you know, in one of my books, The Four Purposes of Life, mm-hmm. uh, the second purpose involves finding your, your, appropriate career and calling. And I differentiate the two. Uh, a career is the way we make an income. Mm-hmm. And there may be many things we like about our career. We may like the people we work with. We may get other perks from it. But if we weren't making any money doing it, we'd have to find something else because a career is about making an income to support ourselves and other people. Right. Calling, though, is involves um, what we would just choose to do in our discretionary time, whether it makes any money or not. It could be a hobby, but it could be something we just gravitate toward. We don't know why we love it, but we do. And it's nice to discover something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for some people, their calling and career are the same thing. In my case, that's probably true. And if somebody says, well, how do I know if my career is also a calling? Easy to answer. If you won the lottery, would you keep doing it? Mm-hmm. And if you keep doing it, then it's also a calling for you. If you quit immediately, it's just a job. So I think if somebody's doing coaching professionally, they're going to run into some other issues. For example, how much do you charge? And that puts you right up against your self-worth. Mm-hmm. What are you willing to charge for your work? When someone says, how much is it? Um, and if you go for the minimum, give them a bargain, that may communicate something to them on another level. Gee, maybe you, gee, you're, you're charging less than anybody else. Why is that? Maybe you're not as good or ex- as experienced. So I think all those factors come into play. I think you know this. I'm just sharing it from my perspective. You, obviously, you know that, Doug. Um, and, and you've dealt with it, too, because you're a professional in the field. So I would say, um, you know, I, I often tell people, I use the word success before I said, don't go for success, go for excellence. Mm-hmm. But also, success I would define as making progress uh, in uh, an area that's meaningful to you. If somebody's making progress in a meaningful area of their life, that's success, ongoing. But I often tell people, if you to, to succeed in a field, you have to be good at two things. You have to be good at what you do, and if you're not, keep practicing. And the second thing is you have to be good at promoting or marketing what you do. 
because you can't help anybody if they don't know you exist. So people who are shy about promoting themselves, they're not just doing it for themselves. They're doing it for the other people that they can help. Mm -hmm. So they have to be really behind that and know they're providing a, a valuable service and put that out there. And don't be shy about it. It's not a time to hide her under a rock or be a wallflower. So that's the professional aspect of it. Um, and then the rest is, is practice. We call it a doctor's, say they are in a practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. keep practicing and we get better. We learn with experience. There's no way to avoid that and get, you, you can get, you can learn faster than other people if you're prepared well. Um, so that's all that comes up for me about what I would say to a professional or an aspiring professional coach is you got to, you have to market it. Yeah. There, we all know in our field, there are people who are really good at promoting what they do, but not that good at what they do. And there are those two. Um, but you want to be good at both if you can. Yeah, for sure. That way you have return business and eventually it's like you don't really have to market so much because people keep referring people to you. Word of mouth is the best for an author or a coach. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, word of mouth, tell me more about that book, Four Purposes of Life. What are the other four purposes? Well, the first purpose is learning life's lessons, which sounds terribly mundane. Oh, my goodness. Of course, we all know that. We learn from our life experience, right? And we learn, we know more now than we did when we were young. But it's, there's a lot more to it. I mean, uh, if we're here to learn, if, if life is, a, if planet Earth is a school and daily life is our classroom, what lessons do we need to learn in order to graduate? In what areas? And I wrote another book called Everyday Enlightenment, which has these 12 arenas of personal growth um, that we're all working on. Um, and so that gets pretty involved. But again, there's a lot more. It, it's, it's suggesting that nobody can fail at anything if they learn a good lesson. All right, beautiful. It's all about learning. All of it. Yeah. That's what we're here for. That's the first purpose. The second is career and calling. The third is more mysterious. It's finding our life path. And I wrote another book that deals <laughs> with our life path called The Life You Were Born to Live. And that's one of my most controversial books, but it's also sold over a million copies because uh, it's pretty accurate in terms of helping people clarify what am I really here to do and what am I Anyway, and the fourth purpose maybe is the most important one of all, which is our purpose that appears moment to moment. So what's right in front? We may not know our cosmic purpose, our existential purpose, but we always know our purpose right now. I know my purpose in this moment is mm -hmm. chatting with you. Mm -hmm. And you know your purpose. But so anyway, that's very important to live purposefully. And what is do I need to do right now? If you're joining a group of people who are gathered together, of course, you have to socially distance at this point in time. But if you're joining with a group, there must be a purpose. You're not just wandering and stumbling into them. You want to give information, get information, commune with them, whatever it is. So it's good to live purposefully. Know what is my purpose? And that's uh, that's the fourth purpose in, in those four purposes of life. Yeah. And I go into a lot more depth, but... But what I've always really appreciated about your way of teaching is those kind of metaphors. Like if, if the world is a, how did you put it? If the world is a school, daily yeah. life is our classroom. Classroom. Yeah. Thank you very much. School and classrooms. It's just great little ways of thinking about things because it gives you an overview that, you know, this job that I'm doing is just a job that I'm doing, but there's a bigger purpose here. And the bigger purpose is to learn the life lesson that is within this. And so it really doesn't matter whether I win or lose in this game or with this job or whatever, but you know, what lesson did I learn in the doing of it? And that's, that's a great overview to have. And it, it allows you really to, to keep that bigger picture and, and stay, you know, going and involved, even though the tough, the going might be getting tough from time to time as it is for a lot of people right now. Um, but it's like, I know, I know I shared that quote with you, but you said, you know, you're a runner. Um, it's a, a man named Marita once said, when running up a hill, it's okay to just give up, to quit as many times as you want, as long as your feet keep moving. <laughs> yes, you not only shared it with me, but I think that's also in one of your books, is it not? In the, the um, 
Probably. <laughs> yes, it is, Dan. It's in one of your books. It's in uh, The Journeys of Socrates. Oh, good. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll read it <laughs> It's a great book. I really like that book. Yeah, I've really enjoyed all your books. I believe I've read them all. I, I, I'm pretty sure. But um, always, always a pleasure to to be speaking with you and to reading your books and to tapping into your wisdom. And, and thank you so much for, for doing that for all of us. If anyone wants to find you, how might you do that? Uh, the best way is website, peacefulwarrior.com. That's it, peacefulwarrior.com. And there's, there's like a free life purpose calculator there. People can get a taste. And it's free. Just click on it, put in your date of birth. You might be surprised at what you see. So that's right on the splash page, the home page. Um, and there are a, a lot of informational things that might be helpful to people. There's even an, an app for that, isn't there? Don't you have a... There's a life purpose app? app, yeah. Yeah, it's called the Life Purpose App. And it's pretty much all the material in my big book. Um, that's accessible for anybody to clarify their life purpose. Yeah, it's a very good app, well designed. Uh, a friend of mine created that. Cool, very nice. Yeah. yeah, very good. So, thank you so much for being here, Dan Millman. It's always um, an amazing pleasure, and it's an amazing honor to have you here on the Essentials Coaching Skills Podcast. And uh, I hope to see you back in Brooklyn sometime soon. Always a pleasure, Doug. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.